welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Today my guest is Dr Phil Boyle, who is a general practitioner with special interest in infertility, miscarriage and women's health. He is the founder and director of Neo Fertility Clinic in Dublin, Ireland. This interview will be about women's health and it will be in two parts. The first part will be discussing menstruation, painful and heavy periods, premenstrual syndrome, PMS, premenstrual tension, PMT, and endometriosis. Thank you for joining me today, Phil. Uh, you're very welcome, Linda. Thanks for having me. So, every young lady, young woman will know about um, having periods, obviously, but can you explain why periods in some cases can be extremely painful and heavy. Why is that and what could we do about it? So first of all, there could be no underlying ill health condition is the first thing because lots of women can have occasional painful periods um, and uh, get maybe unnecessarily concerned about it. So where we tend to get more concerned is where it's starting to affect your life and you can't function so well for a day or there's things that you would like to do that you opt out of primarily because the pain or the heaviness of the bleed is, is just too much. So when that happens, then we're concerned that there may be something uh, going on that isn't quite right. And far and away, the commonest cause of very painful periods is endometriosis. And that's where the lining of the womb that's ordinarily inside the uterus is found outside of the uterine cavity around the ovaries and the fallopian tubes so that when menstruation begins there's a high degree of inflammation external to the uterus producing a lot of uncomfortable symptoms um, uh, so that's that's the, the mechanism behind it um, I guess then we have a new concept um, which is uh, using low dose naltrexone to try and relieve that pain so that currently what I've been doing now for the last 15 years, if uh, a young woman presents to me with uh, period pain like I've described and it's interfering with her quality of life, I'm very quick to recommend low-dose naltrexone now as a first line of treatment. Um, and very, I would say, eight times out of ten, we're going to find significant relief of painful periods by taking low-dose naltrexone. And it works in multiple different mechanisms, uh, but for the user of it, uh, you just take it every night before you go to bed. You take it throughout the entire menstrual cycle, not just when you're menstruating. Uh, but it has other benefits apart from the period pain that I might talk about later. But in terms of, I've seen it where women would come to me in their mid-30s and all their life they've had incredible period pain. And within two months of taking naltrexone are amazed at how effective it is at reducing period pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's where the naltrexone comes in for the period pain and in and of itself it's, it's really useful. And there's a movement now, especially in the United States, where even young women presenting with intense abdominal pain, even if it is controlled with low-dose naltrexone, uh, they, it may be worth considering surgical assessment for them even if they're not trying to conceive. Um, and the reason for that would be if you get to the root reason of the pain, uh, the endometriosis, it's possible 
you may be able to uh, surgically remove the endometriosis and then go drug-free and no need for medications. But there's another thing that very commonly accompanies the painful periods, and that's what you mentioned at the introduction, premenstrual syndrome. So nearly every woman notices a drop in mood uh, with the onset of the menstrual bleed, and that's normal for one or two days every cycle. Uh, but it's especially if you get four or more days of bloating, breast tenderness, mood changes, and you really don't feel very well uh, for, for the, those four or more days before the onset of the menstrual bleed, then that's premenstrual syndrome. Um, and while it's normal for up to two at a push, maybe even three days, and on an occasional month, you may have one bad month out of out of 10, well, that's all acceptable. But if, if it's every month, and I've seen where women can have 7, 10, even 14 days of the most horrific symptoms, and really they know they're not quite themselves, and with the onset of, men, onset of menstruation, uh, they return back to normal. So it's sometimes called like Jekyll and Hyde, because you're two different, uh, completely different people, uh, depending what stage of the cycle you're on. And it doesn't need to be this way, and currently... In medical practice, the commonest uh, pr the commonest treatment for it is to try hormonal contraception or antidepressants, and they don't really work very well. And remar remarkably, low dose naltrexone. If we boost endorphins by taking low dose naltrexone every night, we get this lovely surge of the endorphins, and at least eight times out of ten, uh, we get a dramatic improvement in premenstrual symptoms. Now, surgery to remove endometriosis won't get rid of the premenstrual symptoms for most women. So that's where uh, if, if the two are combined painful periods with PMS, then uh, even with surgery, you may want to continue low-dose naltrexone on a more long-term basis. Um, and in and of itself, it's important, uh, as you mentioned, that I, I run a fertility clinic with Neo Fertility, but... Uh, I've had couples who have come to me and they would say, you know what, we would dearly love to have a baby, but life without premenstrual syndrome is so much better. It's, it's, we've already won, even if pregnancy doesn't occur, because health has improved so much. Um, I've seen uh, one girl in particular who struggled all throughout her university education uh, with a combination of very painful periods five surgeries for endometriosis and horrific PMS and she was on antidepressants, hormonal contraception and trying all of these things was very limited effectiveness and she was at the point, I just want to have my uterus removed and be done with all of this. Mm -hmm. um, but we put her on the low-dose naltrexone and it was nothing short of life-changing for her. Um, and uh, so literally every negative symptom she had disappeared and she was able to cut back on a massive amount of the other drugs she had been on and the naltrexone just um, really got to the root of, of what the uh, negative symptoms were. So it's it's a very satisfying treatment for the patient who takes it and for, for the physician who prescribes it. What's interesting is low-dose naltrexone is an off-label use for this clinical indication. But what a lot of doctors uh, aren't aware of is that the hormonal contraceptive pill is not licensed as a treatment for period pain or endometriosis or PMS, although it's commonly given for these things in an off-label way. So it's very common for doctors uh, to use uh, medications that are off-label. The thing that's different about low-dose naltrexone is uh, a lot of doctors have very little clinical experience of having ever prescribed it before because it's primarily uh, given at a higher dose to those with uh, drug addiction and trying to help them to get off heroin or even alcohol. And not too many doctors have the clinical experience of prescribing it at the standard dose, but even fewer have experience of, of prescribing it at that real low dose. So it's because of, I think, a lot of doctors' lack of clinical exposure to that type of a medication that they're more reluctant to introduce a medication that they've no familiarity with, even though um, the pill is also off-label use. And I think uh, we start out with our clinical experience. So um, from what I've observed consistently and repeatedly for the last 15 years of prescribing in this way, uh, there's no doubt in the world this is an extremely effective treatment. 
uh, for PMS as well as painful periods. Uh, the headache we have is where's the data, where's the publications, and they're not uh, the data. Well, we haven't published on it yet, and it's important that we do so that other doctors are more confident and encouraged that this is something they can safely do. Uh, another huge attraction of low dose naltrexone is um, that when you reduce inflammation, uh, the woman's energy levels improve. And if she's any other uh, autoimmune inflammatory process, then that is more uh, controlled, inflammation is reduced, and other aspects of her health can improve at the same time. So in fact, when I started prescribing low-dose naltrexone, it was more for autoimmune conditions for somebody who happened to attend coincidentally for fertility treatment. And I noted as their autoimmune condition improved, so too did their period pain and their premenstrual symptoms. So it was by identifying a connection like that that I, I eventually got to the point and said, well, if somebody presents and there is no autoimmune condition, but there's painful periods in PMS, let's see how we get on. So it's evolved through clinical experience and observing the impact for, for my patients. That, that's, that's allowed me to, uh, I guess, to understand uh, and accept that this really can help in those cases. Um, the other interesting one is um, uh, where are we with the painful periods, the endometriosis, the PMS. Um, they're probably the biggest ones, but um, I suppose if the focus is what can low-dose naltrexone do to help uh, from a women's health point of view, uh, these are probably uh, top of my list. The other things that I may talk about later would be more specific for miscarriage prevention and um, fertility treatment. But there is one uh, area that is a little bit in between, and that's where we look at uh, ovarian reserve, uh, where a woman can have low ovarian reserve or a blood test that shows low AMH levels. So this is a relatively new development in the world of fertility treatment, but it has aspects with regard to women's health as well, because it will reduce your risk of developing uh, reduced ovarian reserve if you're on low-dose naltrexone. Because ultimately, when a woman has reduced ovarian reserve, it's because her immune system attacks the ovary. And this happens for several years before it's identified in a blood test. And eventually, that autoimmune process where the immune system is attacking the ovary, causing the reduced ovarian reserve, eventually the blood levels go down and you find there's going to be difficulty conceiving. But if you're treating somebody who has these indicators of low endorphins with painful periods, fatigue, uh, low mood, anxiety, PMS, and so on, that if these things have improved, you, you're also protecting her ovarian health uh, for her future fertility. So, so that's another uh, really interesting aspect of the, uh, the ability that low-dose naltrexone has in that regard. Mm -hmm. Just one question. I mean... I had a terrible time from when I was 11 till I was like 50. But I also, um, I used to have terrible pain before menstruating, during. Um, I ha and I also was told I had um, painful ovulation. I mean, yes. what causes painful ovulation? You I mean, you've explained the endometriosis how that's caused. What happens with painful ovulation? So there's a large uh, surge of the oestrogen around the time of ovulation and uh, the oestrogen causes the lining of the womb, the endometrium, to become thicker. Um, and, and then you get a, a, an acute surge of two extra hormones, FSH and LH, that reach a peak and they help that follicle to rupture. So that has a further stimulating effect on the endometrium. And many women with endometriosis, when they have the lining of the womb, the endometrial tissue outside of the uterus, that it gets stimulated acutely um, uh, with uh, the, the hormone levels that surge at that time. And they notice they can often have much more painful periods. So Mittelschmerz, um, the, this medical term for period pain is well recognized, but when it's very sharp and very painful, in addition to painful periods, there, uh, there are two clues that endometriosis may be present. It's also worth mentioning 
that a lot of women have silent, symptom-free, hidden endometriosis and never know about it until they try to get pregnant. So there's a bit of an enigma surrounding endometriosis. Why is it that some women uh, with very strong symptoms when they have surgical assessment are found to have uh, less endometriosis than expected? And then other women with little or no symptoms have, have a, a surprising amount of endometriosis uh, discovered at surgery. So just the only thing I would say uh, is that you wouldn't rely on symptoms alone to say, well, look, I have no symptoms. I definitely don't have endometriosis. That We can't really say that. It's worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had more surgeries than I can count. I lost count when I got to like 12. Um, but I was always told that you know, you're going to have a DNC and it's scraping out the lining of the womb. Nobody ever mentioned that there was the problem on the outside of the uterus. I mean, how do they scrape that the same as they do the inside? Yeah, so you cannot confirm that you have endometriosis unless you have surgery. If you have an ultrasound scan, if you have tubal assessment, if you have a DNC, none of these things have the ability to uh, uh, clearly identify endometriosis. So uh, there's an extra layer of complexity as well because the kind of surgery you need is called laparoscopy and it's mm -hmm. under general anaesthetic where you get an incision below the navel, an incision uh, to, uh, on the side, and an instrument a little bit bigger than a pen is inserted um, into the pelvic area to directly visualize the outside of the uterus tubes and ovaries. The problem is uh, every surgeon, every gynecologist practically does this type of surgery, but only a small handful of them are skilled enough to see the endometriosis and to properly uh, surgically remove it. So it's the real challenge within the world of gynecology to find a gynecologist who subspecializes in this area to ensure a definite diagnosis or exclusion of it, and uh, and really good treatment. So uh, I have seen from my own experience, there are lots of surgeons uh, internationally who just unfortunately won't see or manage the endometriosis effectively. So it's an international problem, and you do have to be careful in identifying the good surgeon. Wow. I mean, I have had a laparoscopy. I think I've had three Um but then I had fibroids and polyps and things uh, removed. But uh, it was my GP who had told me that I'd got endometriosis. And I was thinking the D and Cs were the answer to the endometriosis. But it never was. It didn't ever no. make any difference, um, whatever I, I had done, um, amazingly. But the first gynecologist I saw when I was 17 who explained about having a DNC, he... He was an elder gentleman, and as, uh, as he would be when I was 17. <laughs> You'd think people in the 40s were old. Uh, he, yes. said, he said to me, um, the treatment would be a DNC or having a baby. If you had a baby, yeah. all your problems would go. And it's like, seriously, no, <laughs> I'm not having the baby just to sort this out. But when I did um, uh, my, my first baby was stillborn but the, my second daughter I mean having gone through it all thinking ah oh, I'm on a winner here you know I'm going to be fine now made no difference whatsoever <laughs> it, unfortunately it, it, it was just the same um but my question yeah. is do women who have had children do all these problems resolve themselves no, I, when I went through medical uh, training as well, that, that was common, an opinion that was commonly given. And some women do get relief of painful periods uh, after having babies. So that's, it's a real effect that does happen. But if, if there's endometriosis there, it tends to go silent during pregnancy. And if you're breastfeeding and you're not having any periods for a while, well, you're not going to have much in the way of symptoms. But once the periods start to come back, um, Many women with endometriosis will find that it is still there because it's uh, endometrial tissue that's implanted and embedded in the tissues and it needs to be surgically excised or cut out uh, to get complete relief from it. Mm. So while there are some, uh, yes, that, that that is an effect, I think that's more the uh, the majority, unfortunately, will continue to have symptoms after uh, childbirth as well. 
And it was so funny when I was talking to you in Glasgow, I think in 2010, and you were asking about my health and what medication I took and everything. And I was saying to you that since being on LDN, um, at the age that I was at that point, I thought it was my age that the endometriosis pain and everything had stopped. You know, I just put it down to, ha, oh, you know, I wish this had happened years ago. It was fantastic. And then you explained that it was actually the LDN that had stopped the pain, not because yeah. I was older. And, and that hadn't even occurred to me. It was like, wow, really? You know, if only this had been available when I was 11, when my problem started, it would have made such a big difference to my life. It really would. Yeah, it's, and, and although it is available, uh, it's not widely prescribed. And that's where uh, we need to get uh, the information out there, get more doctors doing it, get publications. And, um, and the beauty about it is it's very, very safe. It'll interact with your coding, morphine or alcohol. Uh, but it interacts with very little else and the side effects are, are little or none. So, mm. um, so if it's, uh, and then the other issue uh, is cost. Um, I've seen some pharmacies looking for 300 euro for a one month supply of naltrexone. Mm. Um, uh, but if, we, if it's made up by a, special, a specialized pharmacy, it's, in Ireland, we can get it for about 30, 35 euro for a one month supply. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to help young girls, young ladies who are suffering with this problem. I mean, do you have case studies that you could write up to get a paper published? Because like you said, doctors do like evidence. They, they need to feel confident. Yeah, the, the, the big challenge is finding the time to do it, uh, to trawl through the data. And, and the other difficulty is because um, I, I know for it's a very real effect that I see clinically all the time. So the majority that I see are presenting for fertility treatment. Mm -hmm. And as they present, I usually have several recommendations all at the same time. So I think that when you want to do a proper controlled study, you want to have one single intervention and assess the impact of that one intervention. Because we do a combination of diet, lifestyle, supplements, and low-dose naltrexone. So um, it is possible we could design a, a study uh, because these days really everybody's, we, we could do quality of life questionnaires, probably the best thing we could do. But I think it's what I've observed through clinical practice. And even though I've observed that, I don't think just tra trawling through my data uh, would convince the skeptics. I think we would need to get a more properly uh, designed study. There was a group in the Mayo Clinic who published a study um, trying to uh, treat PMS with a, a different way of giving naltrexone. And the study design is lovely. And it's a, uh, so we're hoping, in fact, um, to try and replicate that study. But I, I can't trawl through my data. I'll need to do new data, new, newly designed study, get um, uh, ethical approval from a, a study review group, and then enroll people in the study. Um, but you don't need huge numbers. And uh, I presented it at a conference in France about 18 months ago, and um, uh, they were very motivated to do that study themselves on their patients in France to demonstrate its effectiveness uh, for, for PMS is the first thing they were looking for, um, uh, because that's what the, the, the original Mayo Clinic study was on. But when it comes to painful periods, it's particularly effective for that as well. So anybody listening who would like to try LDM, how would they go about going to their, their doctor to ask? How, how would they approach their doctor? Um, I don't know what's the best way mm -hmm. to get a doctor to do something that they're not uh, familiar with. Uh, I do have a presentation uh, on YouTube uh, about, uh, and you've got it. It was for your for your conference mm -hmm. for LDN for women's health, uh, and that's probably one of the handiest things. That it's not a publication in a peer-reviewed journal, but it's a physician with clinical experience presenting uh, what he's observed and pointing to the published data to say, here's here's the mechanism behind how naltrexone works, and I think. 
um, especially the younger doctors, maybe the younger female doctors especially, have the ability to hear that, be interested by it and say, well, uh, let's give this a try then. Um, but a lot of docs don't have that, what would you say, that uh, uh, there the, the could be a, a telescopic rigidity about the way to practice and say, no, the mm-hmm. textbook says ABC, this is what we're doing, and that's the end of the story. Um, and not every doctor would be open to being more creative or experimental. So it depends on the doctor's disposition um, if if that's how they would, if, if they're open to new things. Mm-hmm. And luckily, it would seem that LDM prescribers around the world who are confident in prescribing LDN for different conditions, they would be more likely to prescribe it for um, these indications if they are experienced prescribers. So Exactly. Yeah. So even if you can't so, get your own doctor, I'm sure... If anybody contacted us who would like to find a doctor who would help them, uh, with, they wouldn't necessarily be gynecologists, but uh, LDM prescribers. Exactly. And that's where it starts, because when you're comfortable and familiar with the medication that you know and have used and you're confident it's safe, then you're, you're more inclined to prescribe it for other indications because you've seen its, its effects um, for one condition. That would make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's that's amazing. We've just got um, four minutes left. Um, could you explain what people could do to make themselves healthier? Um, you, you mentioned diet and supplements there earlier. If people are suffering with menstrual problems, is there any particular diet that would help them? Um, so there's a book written on endometriosis, um, uh, several books, in fact, um, and Diane Shepherson Mills uh, is is an author of, of one of the, the original books, and she's a di- nutritional therapist uh, based in the UK, and um, has a big book on endometriosis. But the key uh, component from it is to avoid dairy and avoid wheat. They're difficult foods to digest. They are more pro-inflammatory foods. And um, also clinically from the Ashton Embry's best bet diet, um, he would also say that um, dairy-free and wheat-free or sometimes gluten-free, uh, then you, you've got foods that are easier to digest, you're less inclined to get inflammation and any autoimmune condition or inflammatory condition like endometriosis is likely to improve clinically from, from diet. Fast sugars and highly processed foods are a problem as well. So you'd stay away from your fast sugars, highly processed foods, and the junk food. So you go more for uh, the healthy, non-processed type of foods, um, um, and that could really help. The supplements that I tend to go for that have a positive impact on the immune system would be vitamin D3, especially in Ireland and the UK, because with their lack of sunshine, it's our skin reacting to the sun that makes vitamin D, and we don't have a huge amount of that. So most of us need a vitamin D supplement. Um, And then normally 4,000 units a day and you take it with your biggest meal of the day because it's fat soluble and it absorbs better with a big meal. And then Um, omega-3. And with uh, omega-3, the EPA uh, component is what reduces inflammation. So I typically recommend 700 units of the uh, EPA part of omega-3. So if omega-3 says it's 1,000 milligrams, you have to look and say, yeah, but what's the EPA content in that? Because that's the one that really helps with inflammation. So, um, And if you search around, you could find uh, one that would have a high concentration of EPA at a low cost. Uh, Lambert's is one gr- uh, crowd that I use. They, they were the lowest cost one that I, I found, but I'm sure there'd be others that would be similar. Um, so vitamin D3, omega-3 with your evening meal, um, eating the foods that are less pro-inflammatory and less junk foods. And um, I think that could really help. And I've seen this time and again where somebody smashes their diet. And even though they're on the naltrexone, a lot of the negative symptoms can flare up. So, uh, so naltrexone is good, but if it's complemented with lifestyle supplements and also uh, modest exercise, 20 minutes, um, 20, 25 minutes, uh, three times a week is just really good for um, uh, helping with the symptoms as well. Well, that's been really interesting, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people out there 
going to their doctors to try and get hold of <laughs> LDN. So thank you very much. And we will um, enjoy having the second part of this interview. We'll see Lovely. you soon. Thank you. thank you. Okay, Linda, you're welcome. Bye. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemist are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.